Well, it's always hard to follow a dynamic speaker uh, on an interesting subject like advertising, full of um, uh, romantic images and, and dynamism and, and colour, with one that is a lot drier. Uh, I might be passionate about it, but not, not everyone is. But, but I'll try to make it as, uh, as scintillating and entertaining as I can. Not so much about brand, maybe, but about um, picking up on some of the themes that you've been talking about, about the dynamic change that the industry is going through, uh, confronting new technologies uh, and, and new, new um, product developments, uh, and, and, and really picking up on that theme with the notion of resilience through change. So keeping individual insurers and the industry as a whole resilient to financial shocks, um, which is essentially what regulation seeks to do. Uh, it's, it's, it's there to help try to reinforce good governance to make sure that you're here in 100 years' time. Uh, but it's also there to cater to the inevitable uh, when occasionally things will go wrong. And so how do you resolve uh, and ensure a failure in a way that's not going to have uh, flow-on effects to the industry or to, to the economy or to the wider financial system? So today, what I'd like to talk about is um, current developments in the insurance regulation area in this country. Um, talk a little bit about the review that the Reserve Bank is doing of the Insurance Prudential Supervision Act. Um, then talk a little bit about recent global developments because, you know, we live in a very open world and, and, and nothing that happens here happens in isolation to that, as you know well. And then finally finish on a bit of a uh, prognostication of, well, what might the future look like in the regulatory space? Um, but I thought it would be useful just to do a very brief re recap. Uh, look, this is familiar territory, so I won't dwell on it. Um, until 2010, which is not that long ago, we were unusual. We were kind of right at the, the, uh, the un relatively unregulated end of the, the international spectrum in the insurance sector, very light-handed regulation. Um, and uh, when the IMF came in and did its first assessment of the New Zealand financial system, they remarked on the virtual absence of any regulatory framework here for insurance. Notwithstanding that, the insurance sector had actually, through good governance and good risk management practices, um, survived uh, some difficult periods, and there had been no bad track records of, of, of insurer failures. But there were certainly gaps, deficiencies, etc. So that changed in the enactment of the Insurance Prudential Supervision Act in 2010. So now we've moved to a relatively uh, more mainstream regulatory framework. And we know now that the Reserve Bank's the prudential regulator. The FMA is the market conduct regulator. The Reserve Bank has put in place a, a number of prudential regulations relating to the predictable things, you know, ownership, governance, fit and proper, um, solvency, capital, fundamentally, uh, uh, as well as a risk management program, and unusually, a financial strength rating. Now, that's actually a hangover from an earlier regulation, and we are one of the very few countries in the world that requires insurers to have a financial strength rating, a credit rating. Uh, you can argue the merits uh, and demerits of that, but it's got strengths, I, I think, and is a counterbalance to having maybe a more heavier regulation framework in the absence of it. So this, this represented a bit of a, a sea change in uh, the insurance regulation framework for this country. We went from being virtually non-regulated, relatively, to now being much more significantly regulated than, than we were. And that's not just in the prudential area, it's also in the financial market area where you look at the market conduct, uh, market risk um, regulations, the disclosure requirements, the investment advisor, financial advisor disclosure requirements uh, have greatly um, intensified regulation in, in those areas. You might be thinking, yeah, 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 enough's enough. Um, we're, we're already adequately regulated, no more, please. Uh, and that might be the right answer. Uh, but it's interesting that if you look at, you know, overseas, you don't have to look very far. Look, look to Australia, for example. Uh, and we are still a relatively light-handed, regulated country. Um, we, uh, we have um, 
uh, risk management requirements, for example, at a pretty high level. You know, they're not pitched at the detailed, more granular level that, for example, the Australians, the Brits, the Europeans, the Americans tend to have for their insurers. And I'll come on to that uh, a little bit later in terms of what Australia is, is doing in that space. There are no particularly pres prescriptive requirements for outsourcing or for business continuity or stress testing. Um, and on-site examinations don't really exist, not in the form that they tend to overseas, where you know an on-site examination might be a two or three week process, and it will be detailed, it will be granular. Um, whereas here, the Reserve Bank is, is certainly meeting with, with insurers generally annually, but it's, it's at a much higher level. Now, uh, the other gaps, and again, these may or may not be significant ones, although in time they might become more significant. We're a country in the insurance sector that doesn't have recovery planning. Now, you're not alone uh, because banks yet do not have recovery planning. Now, recovery plans are a little bit like a business continuity plan, but it's on the financial side. So in a business continuity plan, if there's an operational shock, uh, then you have a business continuity plan to get you out of the operational di dysfunction. A recovery plan is how do you get your capital and your liquidity back into a good shape after you've been hit by a financial or economic shock. And so at the moment, we don't have recovery planning requirements here, but we do have elements of it with ICAP, etc. We don't have resolvability assistance. We don't have resolution planning. So that is, if you try to recover, you try to get your company back onto an even keel after a major economic shock, a claim shock, or an asset price shock, uh, if, if you can't, notwithstanding the best plans in the world, get yourself back to an even keel, then you're into resolution territory. And there are some gaps in the framework there. Now, one of them, the last point there, is something I'll return to, and I won't spend a lot of time on it, but policyholder compensation is something that in this country we do not have. It's something to keep an eye on because I suspect in years to come uh, the absence of a policyholder compensation framework will be something that will gain greater attention. So, um, overall, we have a relatively light-handed regulatory framework. Now, that has some strengths. It, it, I think, helps to underpin market discipline. I think it can reduce the, the risk of moral hazard. Uh, I think it can reduce taxpayer risk. Uh, it can also reduce, obviously, compliance burdens and hopefully uh, reduce the, uh, the unwelcome interference with innovation and, and product dynamic uh, efficiency. But there are some downsides as well. Um, and uh, some of those are worth noting, I think. One of them is that the Reserve Bank, which overall uh, has a good reputation for being a solid, sound, credible uh, regulatory agency, maybe is not as well placed as its counterparts, APRA, for example, or um, uh, the, the, uh, the PRA in, in Britain, to detect early enough and to respond early enough to emerging distress. There's a risk there. It puts a lot of reliance on foreign supervisors. Um, uh, and if we do face an insurer failure, we run a risk, I think, of uh, ad hoc government responses. Now, we saw that in the Canterbury earthquakes, uh, where there was a, um, in a, an effective rescue of one insurer. Uh, in the absence of a policyholder compensation framework, there is a greater risk, I fear, of ad hoc bailouts or um, last minute kind of compensation arrangements that seek to protect policyholders from loss. So the International Monetary Fund uh, are making a, quite a timely visit to us at the moment, this very week. They're on their second mission here. Uh, the IMF review every country's financial system. Um, it's supposed to be about every five to eight years. Well, the last one for us was quite a number of years ago. It was 2003, 2004. Um, but essentially, it is a comprehensive assessment of the banking system, the insurance system, um, the payment and settlement system, uh, and the quality of regulation, the quality of supervision. Uh, and it also looks at how vulnerable are we to an exogenous shock or an endogenous shock. So, for example, if we were hit by a major Auckland house price shock, 
uh, or uh, a major GDP shock. How vulnerable is the banking system, and to a lesser degree, the insurance system, to those kinds of shocks? Or a major claim shock that might be coupled with an asset price shock? So the IMF are over here uh, doing, I guess it's a little bit like an external auditor coming in to, to you uh, and reviewing your systems, your controls, your balance sheet, etc. cetera. Um, and that's what the IMF does when they come into a country's financial system. Uh, they're going to look at the strengths, the weaknesses of the framework. And that's what I do for the IMF when I go into numerous countries around the world. Um, but I've also been on the other side. I've been FSAP'd both here and in Australia. Now, I don't know what's worth, worth really, to be FSAP'd or to be an, an FSAPPER. Um, uh, both involve stress. Uh, it's, it's, it's kind of a stress testing process in its own right. Um, so what might they look at and what might their findings be? Well, uh, we won't know what their findings are, uh, publicly at least. Uh, until the first half of next year, which is not far off, when they'll be publishing a high-level uh, report that sets out, okay, we looked at the banking system, the insurance sector, we looked at um, stress tests of the financial system, and here's what we found in terms of these things look pretty good, these things not so good. Uh, these are the recommendations that we would put to the government um, to, to look at. Uh, we may also see some specific reports, including uh, an evaluation specifically of the insurance sector against the IAIS core principles. That's the International Standard on Insurance Regulation. It's too early to say what their findings will be, and although I've had interaction with them in informally, quite properly, they haven't told me what their findings are. So I'm, I'm speculating, but I'm thinking that they may well identify the need to strengthen governance and, and risk management arrangements. They might look at uh, the need for some strengthening of on-site examinations, but I hope in a way that doesn't lead to the intensive processes that we've seen in some countries. So in other words, a sensible balance there between on the one hand an effective supervision regime, but on the other hand wanting to avoid excessive compliance burdens. Um, they are likely to put emphasis on increasing the Reserve Bank's capacity for early warning assessments. So, in other words, get ahead of the curve. Uh, too much of regulation internationally and, and here is reacting already once you see the cracks appearing. Uh, and the trick is to try to get um, a framework that gives you the advance warning of those things. And that's not just relevant for the supervisor. That's clearly relevant for the boards and for the senior management teams of all of the insurers. So it's equally relevant for them. Th there may be recommendations about strengthening some of the prudential requirements. I think capital is, is probably um, already uh, in, is strong by international standards. So I, I don't see that one as being one necessarily likely to be strengthened. But maybe they'll, they'll be saying perhaps there's a need for strengthening risk management and. Uh, business continuity, etc. Um, I think there'll be an emphasis too on more stress testing, uh, on closer cross-border coordination, uh, and on strengthening recovery and resolution. So, in, that, in other words, how well placed are insurers to um, cope with uh, a, a more than severe claim shock than they normally plan for, or an asset price shock, an investment shock? or a liquidity shock, or a contagion risk across the industry? Do they have recovery strategies that adequately cope with those things? Uh, and if something does go wrong and it can't be resolved by the insurer, what's the resolution framework look like? Now, the IMF review is quite timely because it coincides with the Reserve Bank's review of the Insurance Prudential Supervision Act. Uh, and that review is really just in its early stage. So it's intended to to look at, well, how has the Act performed? Um, is it doing its job? Um, uh, is it consistent broadly with um, the approach to banking? Um, is it broadly consistent with um, what we're seeing overseas? So, you know, after five or six years, it is a timely review. And I, I think the Reserve Bank is, 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 is right to be doing that. Um, it's going to look at a number of 
of issues, and I won't go through those in, in detail. Um, essentially, it's going to be looking at each of the key components of the regulations. The relevance for you, I think, is in terms of what might this mean in terms of the compliance burdens for us? What might this mean in terms of a strengthening potentially of regulatory in, um, interventions? Uh, what are the balancing acts between, on the one hand, effective supervision and on the other hand, wanting to give you the freedom to um, adjust dynamically to changes in the marketplace? The last thing you want is a straitjacket that uh, makes it difficult for you to um, reach out to changing customer needs, changing product needs, changing um, uh, financial market needs. So that balancing act is going to be crucial, and the review of the legislation will, will go to that. Um, so I think the review is timely and it's welcome. I would put a question mark over the Reserve Bank doing it, and I, I felt uh, appropriate to mention it because when you look at other countries around the world, uh, it is extremely unusual for the regulator to review its own laws. It's, it's, uh, um, it raises questions of conflicts of interest, and I think that is an issue that um, is something that needs to be looked at, not just for the, uh, for the, uh, the IPSA review, but for all of the Reserve Bank it, it administered laws, where I think a much better model would be one where Treasury leads the review. Reserve Bank obviously has an important input to play, but I think that would provide a more objective, dispassionate review and one with fewer conflicts. But, but that's for, for, for another day. Um, something that's worth briefly touching on, and, and that is that the review of IPSA is deliberately not covering um, the uh, objectives or the purposes of the Act. And, and uh, I'd put a question mark against the wisdom of, of, of that, because it seems to me if you're looking at an Act, you have to step back and say, well, you know, what's it trying to achieve? What, what's the purpose of this law? And I don't think a, a review can intelligently um, give answers to that without first asking the questions, are those objectives still relevant? Are they complete? Are we missing something? The two objectives that are, are in there, I think, are sensible. Promote, maintain a sound, efficient insurance sector and promote public confidence in the insurance sector. You can't argue against that, really. Um, but I think there are two things missing that are worth thinking about. One is that, unlike almost any other country, we do not have an explicit policyholder protection objective. And that seems to me to be something that we should be thinking about as an industry uh, and, indeed, government. Um, because if you look at the underlying rationale for uh, insurance regulation, there are a number of reasons for it, but one of them is to provide a basic level of protection to policyholders on the grounds that they're not well placed to protect themselves through complex disclosures, etc. So I think that issue is, is, is certainly worth, worth looking at. Um, and as I will talk about shortly, uh, policyholder protection doesn't mean immunization from loss. It means giving uh, a, a degree of strength, of confidence to policyholders that, um, that, that the insurer that they're dealing with is, is robust, uh, but it doesn't mean that they are immunized from loss if the insurer fails. But that is where one then gets into compensation questions. The other issue that seems to be missing from the Act that I think is worth looking at is um, the failure side. If you look at the Reserve Bank Act on banking, one of the objectives there is uh, that the Reserve Bank is charged with um, um, avoiding significant damage to the, the, the stability of the financial system if a bank were to fail. Now, on the insurance side, there's no equivalent, and that's where I think there probably should be. Something that says, look, if we're managing an insurer failure, we want to, on the one hand, look to reasonable protection of policyholders, and on the other hand, minimize the damage to the insurance sector and to the real economy that can result from the failure of, of, um, of any insurer, but especially a large one. The review will be looking at uh, principles in the, the Act, and I think for the most part those, those principles are sound. I think where there may be scope to um, strengthen them would be in areas like enhancing competitive neutrality, that is treating um, foreign insurers and domestic insurers equally um, to, to make sure that 
uh, there is uh, a level playing field between insurers and also between different product categories. So at the moment, you've got some insurance products or insurance-like products that are actually not even covered by the Act. And, and I think there's a question mark there about um, the disadvantages that that confers on some insurers and on some products. Uh, I think there's a need to also enshrine in the Act the need for insurance to not just promote robustness, a sound financial system, but also not to compromise the competitiveness, the contestability, the dynamic efficiency of the financial system, which kind of brings on to um, the need for greater transparency and accountability by the Reserve Bank, uh, and the need to ensure that there is robust cost-benefit analysis in any of the regulatory proposals put, put forward. And that brings me to an important issue, which is cost-benefit analysis. And, and in that sphere, I think this is not just true of it, it's true of many um, legislations around, around you know, every sector, that there is really not enough robust cost-benefit analysis. That is essentially the cost-benefit analysis that does take place tends to be too little, too late, not transparent enough, and not subject to adequate external verification. Uh, I think that's as true in the insurance sector as it is in banking. And in fairness to the RBNZ, I think it's true for regulations generally across the country and not just financial sector ones. So I think there is a real need for strengthening. And I think really the answers to that lie as much in Treasury and Cabinet processes as, as elsewhere. And in recent meetings with Mr English, I've raised those issues and I'm hopeful that um, some action might come down the line in, in, in that sphere. Um, that is where I think in the whole area of how do you get more effective cost-benefit screening of proposals? You know, you want to do it at the early stage of policy development, not right at the end when the regulator's pretty much made up its mind what it wants to do. There's been consultation, yep, but, you know, you've been, in, in, in essence, provided with a fait accompli. Uh, whereas a more meaningful approach is to have the cost-benefit analysis right at the early stage in a more open consultative process where the options are really thrashed out. That's where I think we could look across the Tasman at the, uh, the Office of Best Practice um, uh, regulation because I, I have had first-hand first experience of that when I work, worked at APRA. The d degree of scrutiny to which I and my colleagues were subject in putting proposals to that agency, which had a separate minister, uh, was extraordinary. But it was refreshing because it actually forced us to really justify every single thing that we were saying. And they had the power to knock us back. And they did. So, you know, it was a meaningful constraint, and that's something we lack here. I think the transparency of, of decision-making is, is um, another one. And that's where I think there is scope for strength in the Act to uh, enhance the Reserve Bank's um, transparency, its openness in all of the functions that it performs, whether it's licensing or new regulations, modifying conditions to a license, all of that should be subject to much greater scrutiny, much, much more transparency. Um, in that vein, the publication of policies, I think, is really crucial. Now, Section 54 of, of the Act, and I imagine you don't, you, you're not like me, a, a sad guy who picks up Acts at night and <laughs> reads them even to Section 54. Please don't do that uh, unless you're seriously insomniac. Um, already does require the Reserve Bank to publish policies in certain areas, but only in limited areas. Uh, and I think there is considerable scope to broaden that, so it is obliged to publish policies in relation to the exercise of all its powers across the Act, um, to consult interested parties um, in respect of all of the policies that, that it has, um, and to keep those statements of policies under review. So I think there's a need to shed more light in all of, of the, those areas. I think in the, in the sphere of consultation generally, um, the Reserve Bank has improved um, uh, from uh, earlier days. It now has a more rigorous approach to consultation, and that's good. But I think you know, they would probably themselves acknowledge that there's always scope for further um, improvement. 
And that's where I think in the Act, uh, not just IPSA, but in the other Acts as well, uh, there should be greater obligations on regulators, and not just the RBNZ, the FMA as well, um, to consult more rigorously, uh, to have minimum periods required for consultation, so they can't just push something through in two or three weeks, um, that they should have to publish um, submissions from individual submitters unless that submitter has said, no, we don't want it published. They should have to publish a response document. Uh, in other words, we want to lift the game to a much, much more credible um, and transparent and scrutable process. Uh, which kind of brings me on to merits review. That's something that we don't have in this country, and I think it's, it's an issue that is worth consideration. If you look at Australia, they have had for four or five decades now um, a system, not just in the financial sector, where if you, as a regulated entity, uh, are concerned that um, a regulator has put in place or proposes to put in place regulations that you feel go too far, are too costly, are too constraining, are not justified by the objectives of the Act, etc. In Australia, you can actually have uh, an appeal done of that regulation by an independent body, uh, a judicial process charged with that very task. So in Australia, you can have a quasi-judicial body that can actually overturn proposed or actual regulations, and that happens. So that incredibly sharpens the incentives on regulators to get it right in the first place. It gives them greater incentives to consult uh, thoroughly. We don't have that here. We only have judicial review, and that is where I think, again, a strengthening uh, would, would, would be desirable. I think another issue, and this is probably outside of the IPSA, but it's, it's very, very pertinent to what we're all here about today, and that is the insurance sector, is policyholder compensation. Uh, and what I mean by that is that if an insurer fails, uh, in this country there is no framework by which the policyholder uh, or third-party claimant uh, is compensated, can um, make a claim on, on a, um, a fund of some kind um, to be paid out. Uh, if you look at Australia, they have the financial claim scheme. Britain has the FSCS. Uh, most European jurisdictions either have or will have shortly policyholder compensation schemes. Much of Asia either already does or is moving to that. Now, I'd be cautious about how far one goes because, you know, as with anything, there's a cost. Uh, so it raises questions about well, how do we calibrate it. Um, um, it would be industry funded, uh, and what does that mean in terms of fees and levies, etc. But I think it's an issue that is warranting um, further assessment because uh, if we don't have it, there is a greater risk of ad hoc responses of government uh, being drawn into a, a bailout or something of that nature, which could be the very last thing that's in, in anyone's interests. We've seen the reaction to bailouts in the global financial crisis where there was a swing the other way, where now we're looking at bail-in, uh, we're looking at very costly restructuring of banks um, in order to reduce the risk of bailout. Uh, and I wouldn't overstate the risk of that happening here uh, in the insurance sector, but th the, the less you have um, effective resolution frameworks, the greater the risk there is of that kind of overreaction. Well, that's on the domestic front. I thought briefly let's have a quick tour of what's happening internationally because that obviously has a big um, play on what's happening locally. Now, the key, two key agencies overseas are the International Association of Insurance Supervisors. That's the international standard-setting body for insurance regulation and the Financial Stability Board, which really looks at resilience questions, um, um, it, it, it looks at crisis resolution, and also uh, it looks at disclosure issues, including, interestingly, and relevant to you, climate change-related disclosure. Um, a quick gallop through some of this. Uh, insurance core principles um, are essentially the, the Bible that the insurance supervisors work to. Um, they're not mandatory, um, but they are reference points. And when the IMF is over here, as they are now, they'll be looking at how does the New Zealand insurance framework stack up against those, those principles. 
Uh, so it's clearly got a lot of influence. Um, I think looking ahead the next two, three years, the insurance core principles that the IMF will be probably focusing on and which will have influence here will, will be on the capital requirements, on possibly enhancing risk, risk management. Um, I think a much greater emphasis on conglomerate supervision. A number of insurers and banks and securities firms, wealth management firms are bundled into one conglomerate. And so that raises questions about intergroup risk uh, and how do you manage that effectively. Uh, they'll be looking at cross-border uh, coordination, recovery and resolution and policyholder protection. Um, the IAIS is a busy body, I must say. It's also looking at um, the capital standard. That's been going on for some time. Essentially what they're doing there is moving towards a more Basel-like capital framework for insurance. Um, where you know, you're looking at increasing emphasis on risk weightings, of capital having the capacity to absorb losses as a going concern. And what that means is that any recognised capital instrument has to be capable of being converted to equity uh, or to some other loss absorbing instrument um, in a going concern basis uh, at the point of non-viability. So I think we will see progressively, globally, uh, insurance capital frameworks looking more and more bank-like. Um, in, into the future. That might include more use of internal modelling for pricing of risk, whether it be credit risk, investment risk, um, interest rate risk, currency risk, more use of internal models for the, the larger insurers. The IAIS has also been looking at systemically important insurers. Now, we, we're used to hearing this with banking, you know, systemically important banks. Uh, it's less commonly used, but it's not irrelevant by any means in the insurance sector, where if an insurer, either globally or domestically, is systemically uh, important, either in terms of the contagion effects it could have on the insurance sector or on the real economy or impacts on banking uh, or on finan financial markets, uh, there is a move now to have a pre-identification of those insurers to tighten further the capital requirements and other prudential measures for those insurers and to ensure that there is a robust resolution framework to enable those insurers to be resolved in a way that minimises dislocation to financial markets and to the real economy. So I think watch that space more will be coming uh, along those lines. Macro prudential is another one. Now you might have heard of that in, in, in the banking side. Uh, and it's familiar to us, really, because if you look at loan-to-valuation ratios in the Auckland market especially, uh, there's been a great deal of attention on that in the last two years. And the Reserve Bank has been um, making moves uh, in uh, the nature of the loan-to-valuation and other requirements in that space. So well, that's an example of macro-prudential regulation where they use a prudential instrument for macro-stability purposes. Now, in banking, that is increasingly being used. Now, it's got advantages, but it's got big risks as well, and uh, the IMF is going to be looking at those. But in the insurance sector, um, increasingly that is also being looked at. Um, I don't think you would see necessarily any move in the near term, but I think that's something to, to keep an eye on as to whether or not insurance regulation could conceivably be used for macro stability purposes. And, and if it is, uh, how is that best managed? The Financial Stability Board uh, is doing a lot of work. Now, they are focusing as much as anything else on what happens when things have gone really, really bad. So, you know, they're looking at stress testing, uh, vulnerability analysis, and that is something that's been in the banking sector now for a good five, six, seven years. I think if I were you, I'd expect more of that in, in the years to come. Stress testing, Australia's already done it in the insurance sector. Uh, just recently, and I think that's going to increase further. But what the Financial Stability Board is also saying is, look, even with the best will in the world, you're going to have occasional failures. So they've brought out what's called the key attributes, which is essentially an international standard on resolution, primarily focused on banks, but also picks up insurers, payment systems, settlement systems, etc. They are putting emphasis on a number of things, but I'll just draw out two or three things. Recovery planning, which is what I talked about before. That's the stuff that you guys do or should do to 
enable yourselves to recover from uh, an adverse financial shock. Um, resolution plans, and that's what the Reserve Bank would do, that if an insurer cannot recover, restore itself to financial soundness, then it's resolved uh, through the use of statutory management or other mechanisms. And the, the key attributes, the Financial Stability Board, is talking about the, the, the mechanisms by which that can occur. Now, that raises questions about, again, policyholder compensation, uh, the source of resolution funding, um, whether you use a bridge insurer or you simply try to merge uh, you know, two medium insurers into a larger one. Um, yeah, a lot of issues, including cross-border, especially trans-Tasman cross-border coordination. It's increasingly important. Um, and on the trans-Tasman front, Australia can't get through this seminar without a little mention there. Um, and some of you will be intimately familiar with Australian regulation because you are from, some of you are from Australian-based insurers. Now, they've, they've gone through a hectic period of um, reform. They've now bedded down the capital framework called LAGIC. Uh, they call it LAGIC magic. I don't know about the magic bit, but uh, it certainly led to a strengthening of, of the capital framework. Uh, increasingly, emphasis is put on capital planning, and through that, stress testing. Uh, so again, stress testing comes, comes into it. Um, uh, they have also bedded down, uh, and I think this is really important because I've been w working with boards of directors in Australia on insurers and banks and, and uh, conglomerates, and it has been a huge, huge theme for them from the board level down, and that is um, risk management. Uh, where Australia requires a risk management strategy, a risk management framework, a risk appetite statement, a risk culture. The risk culture bit has, if anything, been the most bedeviling element of all. It's a soft underbelly, because if you get your risk culture wrong, you can have all the nuts and bolts of the hard stuff in place, but risk culture will be, will, will be the thing that brings you down. Um, uh, so uh, they've been strengthening the, the rules around the board risk committee, the board audit committee, board sign-offs, so I think that's something to, to look to, to the future here as to the extent to which that might filter through here um, to, to, to some degree. And, it, and I think it already is. Uh, Australia is also looking at a conglomerate approach. And I think this is really crucial because you look at Australia, and this is not unique to Australia by any means, uh, you've got you know, eight or nine big groups that have got banks, insurers, etc., all bundled in them. And, and wealth management, uh, and uh, we have too. Uh, and what Australia is doing is looking at a conglomerate approach. So in other words, don't just supervise the banking group over here, the insurance group here, the wealth management group here, but look at the totality of that, the intergroup contagion, the, dyna the dynamics of risk between those areas and the aggregate exposures. So I think you'll see more in that space. Stress testing, I've mentioned that. Um, uh, recovery planning, resolution planning. APRA's been busy in the banking space on recovery planning. Uh, haven't yet turned their attention to insurance, but they are going through uh, an IMF FSAP next year. And the good thing with the, with, with, with the IMF is that it tends to spur action on. This may be good or, or not good, depending on your, your, your viewpoint. Um, but uh, it's likely, I think, that we'll see Australia move towards recovery and resolution planning for insurers in the next two years. So, look, wrapping up, looking to the future, um, what's the future direction? Well, my crystal ball is certainly no better than yours, uh, but I think we're going to see a number of themes. Uh, increased emphasis on regulator transparency and, and, and accountability. I think that's really crucial, and I think that's where we do need to lift the game quite a lot. Regulator performance is going to come under a lot more scrutiny. The role of the board of directors of the Reserve Bank, you know, at the moment uh, they're, they're doing some things, but arguably not enough. Um, the scrutiny of ministers and of Treasury, of regulators, not just RB, but also FMA, crucial. Um, I think there's going to be uh, more emphasis on stronger consultation with, with the industry. Uh, I think a much greater emphasis on risk appetite and risk culture uh, and uh, stress testing within uh, insurers, both at an industry level, 
and within each insurer and how stress testing feeds into risk appetite and risk tolerance and the calibration of that. Um, and uh, I think you'll be seeing much more emphasis on cyber risk, um, on um, a group-wide group focus on, on risk. In other words, that move from a siloed approach to a much more holistic approach. Um, and I do think the recovery, resolution, policyholder compensation issues uh, are going to gather more attention. So I feel that uh, in the years ahead, um, we're not talking too many years, we, we will see further major changes in the insurance sector regulation space. And some of them, I think, will be quite intellectually challenging. That they're going to take regulation into a much more dynamic phase than it has been previously. Thank you. Jeff, um, Jeff, thank you very much. Uh, we won't um, send you off uh, empty-handed. Uh, I'll just say that I'm, I'm very pleased that there are diligent people like you who read acts at night to save people like me from having to do so. Uh, so that's very well deserved. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Uh, let me just give you one question that uh, comes through on the email, because um, we, we've got a minute, minute or two. Uh, given the latest FSAP was pre-Christchurch earthquakes, what are your expectations on the findings of the latest FSAP? Um, well, it, it's, it's a bit premature. I mean, a, as I say, although I have a lot of interaction with the fund and, and indeed have been speaking with the IMF team during the, the NZFSAP, um, uh, I, I'm not at liberty to say where they'll be coming from. Uh, but if, if I were doing their job, um, I guess what I'd be looking at would be uh, a strengthening of the uh, Reserve Bank's capacity to detect early emerging risks, um, not a reactive but a much more proactive approach. I think I'd be putting emphasis on deepening the expertise within the Reserve Bank. It's new to the field, so I think that needs to be strengthened. I think uh, the capital framework is already reasonably comprehensive and quite tightly calibrated by international standards, so I'm not sure I'd be advocating a strengthening of that. I think I would perhaps be looking at how do you get boards to focus more on risk management, risk tolerance, risk appetite, risk culture. And I think that is, is certainly worth, um, worth further, further emphasis. Um, I think much closer cross-border coordination with Australia is going to be needed than occurs at the moment. Um, I think more emphasis on getting the balance between promoting resilience on the one hand, while also ensuring that you're not stifling dynamic efficiency on the other. Because the last thing you want is to be promoting a resilient insurance sector that is then in a straitjacket and it cannot evolve and respond to changing market demands. So I think getting that balance is going to be crucial. I think finally the IMF will almost inevitably um, raise issues about policyholder compensation, about how do you manage an insurance failure in a way that minimizes taxpayer risk, gives reasonable protection to policyholders, uh, and minimizes the risk of flow on effects to other insurers. Thank you very much for your time today. Jeff Mortlock, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much.